five minutes after 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. You know, I, I'm going to tell you, I don't know much about Dante. I really don't know. So I'm going to have to pretend as we speak to Joseph Lucy that I know something about Dante. Mm-hmm. But what I do know is about parental love and love in, in general, I guess, as much as anybody else does anyway. And when I heard his story about his, uh, he'd lost his wife um, in a car accident. He, um, his wife was pregnant at the time. And um, so he became a father and a widower in, at the same moment. And uh, that's how I was told about Joseph Lucy by the publicist who called me. Who called me? Nicole? Nicole yes, Nicole. Me? Um, so he has this amazing story of how somehow the Divine Comedy by Dante has greatly affected him since that that story I just told you. And he's written a book about it. It's called In a Dark Wood, What Dante Told Me About Grief, Healing, and the Mysteries of Love. And if anything beautiful can come from something horrible, this is an example of it right here. Uh, Joseph Lucy, first of all, I, I hope I'm saying your name right. And, uh, and gosh, I'm so sorry for, for that sad, sad story that we had to know first, but thank you for being on the air with us today. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Larry. Thanks so much for having me. Where are you? Where are you calling from? I'm calling from uh, the beautiful Bard College campus, where I'm a professor and uh, have been lucky to teach for the past 13 years, and uh, it's a beautiful summer day here. How about you? I'm in Ocala, Florida, and it's a rainy day. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but it's a beautiful I rain. The sun always sh- it was always shining in Florida. It, it is, above Some the clouds. The you you got to fly. you got to get up <laughs> above the clouds. Um, well, well, thank you for being on the air with us. How, how long ago did the accident happen? The accident happened, Larry, in uh, November 29, 2007. So it's almost mm-hmm. been eight years now. And um, my book is, you know, is a chronicle of of what it was like to become a widower and a father the same morning as my eight-and-a-half-month pregnant wife, uh, Catherine, had a fatal car accident. And before she died, uh, our daughter Isabel was rescued by emergency cesarean. And um, it's the story of the painful steps of, you know, rebuilding very slowly my life in the aftermath of that tragedy and how um, I turned for guidance and solace to a beautiful work of literature that um, you mentioned, I heard you said, you know, you weren't too familiar with Dante. It's okay. It's it's one of the names that a lot of people have heard of, but very few people have read. And, and the book was written for people with no knowledge of Dante at all. It's a very gentle introduction. And above all, it's it's not so much Dante. It's just to show that when we go through our really dark and difficult moments, that we can, you know, there's self-help books, there's a world of of media that we live in in this information age, but there's also great works of art that, you know, have become great for a reason that can help us. That is an amazing thing to say. I I, I think that's so often about art, and and art comes in all forms, and, um, gosh, people who love paintings are going to hate this, but but I think paintings are the the least likely to actually change me. Uh, Mm. (laughs) A a work of writing or a work of music or a movie, you know, is is more likely going to be the work of art that's going to affect me. Not that a painting couldn't. I I think the story of painters does, but... but, Mm. uh, but yeah, yeah I, and actually, actually, I didn't want, I didn't, yeah. I didn't want you to know. I thought my microphone was off. I was going to pretend I knew everything about Dante. <laughs> no, I'm, no, I wrote the book for people like you. <laughs> An introduction. You I'm, couldn't have fooled him. I'm teasing. I'm just I'm teasing. trying to boost Dante's sales, and uh, you know, whatever you know, his well, work is it's in the public domain now. But you know, uh, what you said earlier, whether it's um, music, whether it's painting, whether it's literature, we all have the things we respond to, but. I think that when you go through a tragedy, what happens, happened to me, that's for sure, is that it almost becomes a kind of an incredibly introspective, um, deeply, almost like a kind of prison of the self where you're just wrapped in your own thoughts. And I think we need things to take us out of ourselves. And I think that's what great art does, you know, great writing or literature. It brings us outside, shows that we're not alone, that other people have suffered and that 
we can find um, guidance along the way. Do you know in the song Vincent by Don McLean, um, he writes the the one verse about when when uh, Vincent Van Gogh committed suicide, and he says, um, uh, "The world was never meant for one as beautiful as you." It it is like when, when I well that song's so old. I hope you know the song. Do you know the song? I do. Yeah. Okay. And, and I hope that wasn't condescending to say that, but I just, you know, I just don't know who knows things. No, no, no. He's, <laughs> he's a great artist. I mean, I think that with, um, you know, I think I always tell my students, I don't want them to think of great literature as like broccoli, like something that you should read because it's good for you. You know, the way you're supposed to eat broccoli, and that makes it all automatically something they don't want to do because, you know, who wants to just, when you can eat ice cream, why do you have to eat a, a green vegetable that you might not like? Yeah, I think right. that too often we think of great literature as something daunting, as something that we're supposed to do, but the point is is that I actually think they bring great pleasure that once you kind of figure it out, once you get into Shakespeare a little bit, figure out the terms of phrase, it actually is the most pleasurable thing you can do as, as you learn to read these books and that it's not just the kind of um, you know it shouldn't be this task it, it's really something that is a joyous companionship I found what reading for me has always been that and, yeah, um, yeah. you know I, 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 I really hope that um, this book resonates with those who start to think of, of reading as something that can be a lifelong companion I love uh, the title that you chose because I've been in dark places before in uh, uh, dark woods, dark forests, but there's always some sort of a, a glimmer of light that's shining through somewhere. It may be very tiny, but it's there. And I think that was such yeah. an appropriate title for the book. Well, thank you. You know, the opening lines for Dante's great poem, The Divine Comedy, are in the middle of our life's journey, I found myself in a dark wood. And it's like you just said, it's it's our life's journey. We'll all get there, whether it's the death of a, someone we love or a crushing personal setback, something that lands us in the dark wood. But as I wrote my book, I you know I, I felt like okay, the defining moment in my life is the death of of my wife Catherine. I learned that it's not what lands you in the dark wood, but it's what you do to get out that really reveals your character mm. and that you know because we're, we're not in control of the things that, that bring us tragedy unfortunately they happen to us and yet the struggle to get out of the dark wood was really what the book is about and I think that's what Dante's message is all about and the, big, and the gates of hell uh, in Inferno 3 early in his poem he writes um, the gates of hell say all ye who enter here abandon hope and that's what hell does. You know, it's a space where you just give up. You, you, you succumb to despair. You can't go on. But Dante's message is that you have to never give up hope. And that, um, you know, as bad as things got for me, and I made a lot of mistakes along the way, you know, especially with my daughter. I had dreamed of being a father my whole life. And suddenly I was so grief-stricken that I was blocked from being you wow, know, full wow. of bad for my daughter. I needed my, my family's help. But keep hope and um, keep keep an open heart that, that's really what got me through did you ha did you how do I ask this without I, I don't even know how to ask this so but were you able to by the time she was old enough to kind of really get to know you because the first half year of our lives we do we, we're not aware of much you know mm -hmm. and we start to awaken yeah. we we as people start to awaken i don't know when that starts six months one year right. but but i mean were you able to um get past the death of her mother um, by the time she was awakening? If, if the, I don't know any other way to ask the question. You know, I think, if I if I understand, I think what you're saying is, could I separate her birth from uh, Catherine's death? In other words, could I see her and not see um, my, you know, my late spouse? Yeah. The answer is yes. I never, at a certain point, Isabel, my daughter, became her own person. She's you know, I, I understood the circumstances to her birth, of course, they were always there, but she became a living, breathing entity separate from that. Where Catherine's death held me back was, I think I was so devastated and so um, lost in the, the fog of grief that 
parenting is tough. <laughs> you know, yes. You, yeah, yeah. As many as we all know who are parents. And I just, it was really hard for me to kind of um, put my daughter's needs at the center of my world and get over my own grief. That's where my family came in. I have a big, loving Italian family. My mom, who was in her late 70s when Isabel was born, and my four sisters and brother, they basically co-parented with me. So they did a lot of the heavy wow. lifting that went into parenting. Joseph, can I ask and you to hang on really just a second? Yeah, I'm, sure. so, I'm sorry, we have to take a break. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't mean to Absolutely. cut you off right there. Let's take a break. We'll be right no back worries. with Joseph Lucy. The weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident for today. More clouds and sun along with a couple of heavy thunderstorms around. There can be flooding downpours and damaging wind gusts in any thunderstorm today. The high 84 to 88. Tonight, mostly cloudy, warm, and muggy with a couple of showers and a thunderstorm, some heavy, low 72 to 76. Tomorrow, clouds and breaks of sun with a couple of showers and heavy thunderstorms. Watch for flooding by 84 to 88. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm Bill Lundberg. Are you wasting hundreds or thousands of dollars on termite retreat fees? If you're not with Turner Pest Control, you probably are. Turner Pest Control offers the industry's only termite and pest control package that never charges retreat fees, ever. You can get started today for only $99. This is a value of $500 or more. This includes treatments, installation of monitoring stations, quarterly pest control, and a lifetime guarantee, all for an unbelievable low $99. Even if you have another pest control provider, visit turnerpest.com to find out how you can avoid paying those high termite retreat fees. Hi, this is JP from Penn Flooring here in Ocala. I would like to invite you to come in and visit our spacious showroom where we have solutions for every style and budget. From wall-to-wall carpet to hardwood floors and tiles, we have an unsurpassed selection of flooring. At Penn Flooring, we've provided quality customer service with a family touch for over 25 years. Visit our website at penflooring.com or come by our showroom, 1201 Southwest 17th Street, just over the bridge. Penn Flooring, quality customer service with a family touch. If you're anything like I was, the thought of getting older was the last thing on your mind. But here we are. For me, it started slowly. The lack of energy. Never being in the mood. And when I was, I could never perform at my best. I tried the pills and other treatments with minimal results. And all but given up on my sex life. Then, I found the doctors at New Male Medical Center. Wow! They made a new male out of me. Feel like I'm 25 again. I have renewed vigor, so much more energy, and no longer worry about my performance. New Male treated me like my situation was one of a kind. With a custom treatment plan that really works, I feel great. They can create one for you too. It does not matter if you suffer from low testosterone, erectile dysfunction, or just want to last longer. New Mail will help you. Call New Mail Medical Center today at 352-404-4779. 352-404-4779. That's 352-404-4779. It will change your life. 352-404-4779. All right. uh, Thank you for waiting through the break. Uh, Joseph Lutzi is on the phone. I hope I'm saying Joseph's last name right. I'll ask him to correct me. I did not do him justice in the beginning. Let me tell you some of his credentials. Uh, he is a Dante scholar. He is a professor of literature at Bard College. He did mention that himself earlier. He's the recipient of the, uh, oh, I'll try this one, Scaglioni Prize for Italian Studies from the Modern Language Association, a teaching prize from Yale. Um, I guess that's what that is, right? Mm-hmm. He is an essay award winner from the Dante Society of America, a critic whose essays and reviews have appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Book Forum, and the Times Literary Supplements. So the fact that he's on our little show is pretty impressive. But I'll, I'll keep pretending I know who Dante is. <laughs> Although I did look him, I did look him up in, in Wikipedia. Now, I, I'm, I'm, see, I'm being a little exaggerating here because I do remember the subject. I just don't remember anything about it. The book is called In a Dark Wood, What Dante Told Me About Grief, Healing, and the Mysteries of Love. And if you just tuned in... Um, the flap of the inside of the book kind of gives you a thumbnail sketch of where we were so far in the first half of this interview, which says, on a cold November morning, Joseph Luzzi, a Dante scholar and professor at Bard College, found himself racing to the hospital. His wife, Catherine, eight and a half months pregnant, had been in a horrible car accident. In one terrible instant, Luzzi became both a widower and a first-time father. And uh, he's been explaining how uh, the artwork of words that Dante left us has helped him in this lifetime. Joseph, am I saying your last name correctly? You're, you're doing pretty well. I give you an A A minus. It's um, it's Lutzi, like you know, Lutzi. Sort of the way you say pizza with a, a okay, T okay. 
Okay. Imagine a TS sound. And you have somebody been, who has been waiting on hold through the whole break, so let's take that phone call. Good morning. Thank you for waiting, by the way. You're on the air with Joseph Luzzi. Yes, good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, um, yeah, I, um, I, I read everything. Um, and uh, sometime during high school, we read an abridged version of uh, um, The Inferno. Um, and we did the the uh, the Odyssey. We did uh, um, several of the Shakespeare plays. Uh, you know, don't be afraid of Shakespeare. Uh, Macbeth is one of the great action novels of all time. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you went to a good high yeah. school. They had you reading some great books. <laughs> all right. Did you? Could you? Yeah. Hear? Well, well, they were in the public domain. I guess it was cheaper for them to purchase. <laughs> <laughs> that could be. All right. Well, th thank you for all right, that. Have a good day, all. Thank you. Can I ask you something, as a thank professor, you. Joseph? As a as a professor, sure. when uh, yeah. when a movie is made of a of a work, um, like a Shakespeare work, for example, do, sure. I mean, how, do do you steer your students away from watching the movie because the because it might not exactly be the the work that you want them to know? That's a really good question. You know, I I also um, teach film, and I've written a book on film, and. I I love the film medium. It has a, a rich history of its own. You know that that it's a younger medium than literature, but it's an incredible works of, of artistic expression in film um, as well as literature. What I tell students is, you know, the film is an interpretation of a book, just like they'll have an interpretation of the book. So when you see um, Romeo and Juliet, uh, I think it was. Was, uh, the Lerman film, where, which set it in modern Los Angeles, that's an interpretation and updating of Romeo and Juliet to modern times, that the director has interpreted the play in a certain way. When they read a book, they're doing their own interpretation, and in a way, they're also writing the book alongside the author. You know, that's the beauty of literature. The book doesn't change. It's just, you know, bound pages and words, and it stays uh, like that forever. The interpretations of the book change for every generation, and that's what a classic is, a book that can keep renewing itself, keep making sense mm -hmm. to readers. Most books that are written disappear. I think one literary scholar estimated that something like only 0.5% of all books written ever last. That means that you know, that what you're reading from a few hundred years ago is just the tip of the iceberg that most of the books have gone away. And I think the ones that last are ones that make our imagination, set our imaginations on fire. So if a book has inspired a director to make a film, he or she will have his or her take, no question. But I tell my students, don't let that block out your own reading. You know, make your own inner movie <laughs> about the book. Who would you have starring? Yeah, right. Who would you have? How would you stage it? And I think that, you know, when you think of the director as just one reader among many, it kind of, um, it both takes the pressure off saying, oh, did the guy get it right? Or did she get it right in, in her interpretation? That it's infinite what you can do. And that, um, you know, that, that's what reading is, is interpretation. Did you do writing as therapy in the beginning and not really realizing that's what it was for you? You know, writing for me is work, not therapy. And it's work <laughs> that I love. I've, I've always written, and I was writing at the time more scholarly stuff. One of the things that my wife's dad did was try and inspire me to, to reach more general audiences, which I did with, with this book and a book before it called My Two Italys. I, I had felt for a while that I wanted to kind of reach out of, of the figurative ivory tower, you know, where you're just writing for other scholars, and, and it's a, a smaller conversation, one that I love, but I think when, when Catherine died, I felt, you know, you really feel the fragility of life, and I felt, okay, if, if I've wanted to write a book that is for regular readers, now's the time, because who knows when, when you'll ever get the chance to do something, right? So, so Isabel, is, Isabella is seven, going on eight? Isabel is seven and a half, yeah. She's a beautiful, happy, uh, wonderful little girl. Do you and, read to uh, her? Oh, yeah. I think, you know, one of the things that, um, my book is a lot about learning how to be a dad, not just a father, but learning how to 
put someone's needs before your own. And one of the most important um, aspects of my relationship with my daughter was when I started reading to her every morning. We started reading the Harry Potter books. And I grew up in a house with no books. I was in, my parents were immigrants from Italy, no, very little to no education, just a great school education. So we didn't have books growing up. And so I never really knew what it was like to read, as, you know, to be read to. And as I read to Isabel, I could feel our bond being cemented. And one morning, I'll never forget it, you know, I was reading through the Harry Potter books, which I hadn't read before, and she said, Dad, um, you know, I want to read it on my own. And oh. <laughs> that was when my job became obsolete. Yeah, became, right, right. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. So oh. I, on the that's one like, hand, that's I like, thrilled, it's like, yeah, yeah, it reminds okay. me of when my son was learning how to ride a bicycle and I let go of the seat. Yeah. And he uh-huh. didn't need me anymore. Yeah. 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 He didn't yeah. Need, she didn't need me. And now she's like, uh, you know, I can handle this on my own. And it's kind of the moment I was both dreaming of, but now I miss a little bit, you know, those that are a little morning ritual reading. Did Catherine share your love yeah. of, of, of uh, did, did Catherine and you share this, the love of the same types of writings? You know, um, Catherine was her own person. She was, um, she was not, you know, an academic. She was more. She had. She was an actor. She tried to make it in New York as an actor. It never really worked out the way she hoped it would. Um, she sang. She danced. She was in a different world than me. Um, we we had different interests, but we had common values. You know, family was mm-hmm. everything to both of us. Um, we were on the same journey of life together, and we brought different things to the table. So. It's interesting to see how Isabel is a synthesis of, of those two worlds, you know, the interests of my interest and her, her birth mom. Did you look at this as a memoir when you first uh, started, and did you write this after you had reread The Divine Comedy? I, I live with The Divine Comedy. You know, it's always in my teaching, always in my thoughts. So it was a given, you know, I'm always thinking about The Divine Comedy in some way. When I first started to write the book, I thought it would be more of a straightforward memoir of, you know, losing Catherine and, and going through grief and mourning and trying to rebuild my life. And I remember showing it to my agent, and she said, it, it's too inward. She said, like, I don't hear the traffic in the street or see the people walking by the window where we're sitting. And I didn't, I thought, well, you know, I, I guess I see what you're saying. This is too personal a story. And then at a certain point, I then I... I started to realize that it wasn't just a story of grief and mourning. It was also a story about how my love for Dante's writing, how living with his poetry, his work, it helped me get back on my feet. And that the wisdom and understanding I got from this great book was so essential to my rehabilitation um, as a human being. And so, because I had really actually thought of writing a book on Dante, uh, for general readers, and this grief memoir. So they were. I was thinking of two separate books. And Isn't that interesting? I realized, gosh, they're one book. Your editor, wow. publisher, wow. Whoever, whoever told you about the, the can't hear the traffic in the street. That is a great thing to tell a, an author because it's it's great negative feedback with, with a very constructive purpose. You know, you, you heard something you probably didn't want to hear because you wanted her to say it was. No, gr- I didn't great. want to hear it. Yeah. You know, the other thing is that we think that we we need to have a personal relationship to our story. It's true to a certain extent. You know, I, I've had the, the chance to speak with writers groups and. The one thing I notice is there's a moment where a young writer, or it doesn't matter the age, I could be an older person, let's say a developing writer is trying to find his or her voice, and yeah. what usually helps them find that is when they write about something they know very well, either a person or a thing, you can feel that. But that's just the first step, because the writing ultimately, I think, isn't about you it's about communicating it. Wonderfully said. Uh, so. Joseph Lutzi, thank you so much. What a great interview. I feel like we got to know you in that little bit, bit of time. Yeah. Uh, the book is oh. called In the Dark Wood. Uh, we have to run. We will push put the uh, website on the Facebook page. I apologize for not being able to get it on the air. Thank you, Joseph. Mm-hmm.
Radio. I'm Lillian Wu. Authorities are revealing details about last night's movie theater shooting in Louisiana. Nine people hurt, two women dead. Lafayette Police Chief Jim Craft believes that John Russell Hauser, who ended up killing himself, had intended to escape, saying he was in possession of disguises. His vehicle had a switched uh, license tag on it. Two people were killed by the gunman. One person is still in critical condition. Police also say they don't have much to go on as to why Hauser would have done this. They're asking for anybody who knew him him to step forward. Fox Radio's Evan Brown, President Obama heading to Kenya, where his late father's from. One fourth of the nation's police force has been deployed in the capital. Islamic insurgents, including Al Shabaab and Boko Haram, have launched recent attacks in the region. Fox Radio's Jessica Gallagher in Nairobi, Kenya, and a state appeals court tossing out one of two felony indictments against former Texas Governor Rick Perry. Fox News, we report, you decide. Okay, so let me see if I get this straight. You want the truck with the most towing power, the most payload, that accelerates faster, stops quicker, handles better than ever, that works smarter, is loaded with a ton of new technology and tools, has best-in-class gas mileage, that doesn't rust, and has the government's highest overall safety rating, five stars. Have I got that right? That's all you want, right? Everything? Okay. What color? This is the high-strength, military-grade aluminum alloy body Ford F-150, and this changes everything. Built Ford Tough. Towing when properly equipped with available 3.5-liter EcoBoost V6 4x2. Payload when properly equipped with available 5.0-liter V8 4x2. Class is full-size pickups under 8,500 pounds GVWR. EPA estimated fuel economy rating of 19 city, 26 highway, 22 combined MPG, 2.7-liter EcoBoost V6 4x2. Actual mileage will vary. Government five-star safety ratings are part of the U.S. Department of Transportation's new car assessment program, safercar.gov. Ouch. Does pain have you glued to the couch? Yes, unfortunately it's true that every year we must get older, but that doesn't mean we have to deal with pain in our back, knees, or shoulder. If your muscles and joints are sore, don't worry anymore. Come get acupuncture from me and you'll be pain-free. Acupuncture starts as low as $35.